our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God, who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Let us pray. O God, you reveal your mighty power, chiefly in showing mercy and kindness. Grant us the full measure of your grace, that we may obtain your promises and become partakers of your heavenly glory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The first lesson that is appointed for the 11th Sunday after Pentecost is taken from the book of Exodus, chapter 16. This will also serve as today's sermon text. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt! There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. You have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, You will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses told Aaron, Say to the entire Israelite community, Come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening, quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Everyone is to gather as much as they need. Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it by the omer, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. Everyone had gathered just as much as they needed. Then Moses said to them, No one is to keep any of it until morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. The word of the Lord. 
Gospel according to St. John, chapter 6. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. And they asked him, What must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, Always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The Gospel of the Lord. And the night draws near 
and the day is almost gone. Almost gone. At the river I stand, guide my feet, hold my hand, take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for our consideration is the first lesson that's appointed for the 11th Sunday after Pentecost, the, the text from Exodus chapter 16. In the name of Jesus, your people of God. I'm starving. I don't mean that in the over-exaggerated way that we often say that, like, like I haven't eaten in six hours, so I, you know I'm starving. And I don't say that because I haven't even eaten, eaten supper yet. That's normal. But I most definitively mean it when I tell you I am starving. Truth is, I, I can't help it. I, I was born this way. It's in my nature. I am starving to see, to experience. See water changed into wine. To see Jesus, the Son of Man, walking on the water. To see the lame leap and run. To see the dead brought to life. I want to see an axe head float on water. I'm starving to see. What about you? Do you love to see, to experience bread falling down from heaven? Would you like to see lepers made clean? We can't help it. It's our birthright to want to see. It is in our nature to be like Thomas and to say, unless I see because we were created in the image of God. We were created for spectacular things. And so we can't help it to want to see, to need to see, to be starving to see. Of course, seeing isn't the answer either. And the people who wanted to turn Jesus into their bread king, they had seen plenty after all, hadn't they? They'd seen him take just a couple of bread, loaves, and some fish and feed thousands. And still they weren't satisfied, satisfied. Still they were starving. So to the people of Israel, they had seen bread rain down from heaven. And yet they starved too. So seeing or not seeing, the truth of the matter is, we are all starving. We're all starving to know God. So what will God do? God feeds his starving people. God feeds his starving people so that they may know his grace. God feeds his starving people only and always according to his word. Certainly not God's fault. 
that people are starving. Is there any question at all that people are starving? Not even 30 days after the people of Israel had left Egypt do we hear them and see them where they are at here. What do you hear? If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. It's enough to make you shake your head, isn't it? Had they forgotten? Had they forgotten the ten plagues that had so completely ravaged and broken Egypt that it was a nation no more? Had they forgotten the plush gifts that were lavished on them according to God's word when they walked out the door, when Pharaoh finally said, get out of here and don't come back? Had they forgotten the Red Sea where God parted the waters and led them through on dry ground and then returned the waters to their resting place and demolished and destroyed the greatest army on the planet at that point? Had they forgotten it all? Had they forgotten the condition in which they lived in Egypt? That they were, in fact, slaves? Had they forgotten their own cries to the Lord? Pleading and begging him to come to rescue them from their oppressors. Had they forgotten it all? <laughs> it's certainly not God's fault. Could God do all of that? Could God do all of that? The plagues and the sea and the deliverance, could God do all of that and forget his people? Would God do all of that and then be too impotent or too inconsiderate to feed them? It makes no it makes no sense. Nevertheless, they grumble and grovel about their hunger. What will God do? Will God visit plagues on them? Will God, by nature, destroy them? He could. He maybe even should, but he will not. God will feed his starving people. The Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. Tell the people, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Wow! Can, can you even begin to fathom it? Can you even begin to imagine it? We, we get so consumed, we're, we're so caught up in the obvious miracle, so, so absolutely fascinated and mesmerized by bread falling down from heaven that we, maybe we fail to notice, notice the subtle miracle in this account. Did you catch it? Then you will know that I am the Lord. That's the subtle miracle. They would know that he is the Lord, that he is the God of free and faithful grace. And you talk about grace. What undeserved grace, what undeserved love it was for them. See, God always fills the body in order that he might fill the soul. And so in giving them exactly what they don't deserve, God demonstrates to his people grace and grace to the full. It isn't God's fault that people are starving. And is there any question that people are starving? We spend our time chasing all of the physical things that mean literally nothing. Meanwhile, neglecting all of the things that mean everything. Jesus, after all, did say, What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit 
the soul. And still, still God showers more blessings on each and every one of us than we could possibly enumerate or deserve. So many blessings that they actually become snares and traps for us. As we chase around trying to keep up, keep foot. It's not God's fault. It's not God's fault that people are starving, that we're still grumbling and groveling about having enough or having too much. But won't you see the starving people? Won't you see with me and see a God who miraculously shows us grace upon grace even when we don't deserve it, and especially when we don't deserve it? Won't you see? Is it any less miraculous that God should fill our bodies through institutions and industries than if you were to simply rain it down from heaven? Is that any less miraculous? You who want to see water turned into wine, won't you instead, won't you instead look at the water of your baptism and there see an even greater change as your status before God changes from sinner to saint. You who want to see lame men run, won't you gladly look on the faithful service of God's saints, God's people just like you, doing spectacular things hidden under ordinary, everyday dealing? You, who want to see bread rain down from heaven. Won't you see Jesus, who is the bread of life? You, who want to see the dead brought to life, won't you listen to the words of the gospel and understand that there the Lord of life himself brings people who are spiritually dead to spiritual and then what, won't you understand his grace, his undeserved love? You who want to see the mouths of lions closed like they were for Daniel, won't you see the mouth of the roaring lion who roams the earth looking for someone to devour closed with, closed with just a simple word? It is finished. Jesus, Son of God, who took on flesh and died for you and died for me and died for a world of sinners with real body and real blood, a real death rose from a real grave. And it names you forgiven. And it marks you a child. And it guarantees you a place in an actual heaven for an actual eternity there with God himself and all the saints in glory everlasting. And if that isn't spectacular, then I don't know what is. Won't you see? God feeds. God feeds his starving people in order that they might know his grace. And then, feeding his people that they may know his grace, might you not also see that he does it always and only according to his word. Did you catch that little hook towards the end of the account? It was a good one. Listen again. That evening, quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. And the people asked, What is it? Isn't it tempting to hear that and just dryly go, yeah, so what? That is, after all, what God said. He said he was going to do that, and well, he did it. That's the point. 
Or, or do you think the Israelites were so completely dense that they looked at the stuff and they didn't have any clue or any idea what it was? Could it possibly be that in place of their grumbling and groveling, doubt had crept in? Doubt that now knowing God as they did, they also knew how sinful and selfish they had been in grumbling and groveling in the first place. And so they doubted whether God would or whether God should keep his word. It's natural to wonder, sinners that they were, sinners that we are. And so that's the point. God feeds his starving people always and only according to his words. See, with God, words are never just words. Words inevitably and invariably lead to action. When God speaks, God does. So he spoke to the people, and then he delivered. God feeds his starving people according to his word. I want to see God's people so consumed with his word that it radically alters the way that they look at life. See, God never separates body from soul. Do you ever notice that? God always treats the person as a whole. Smart of him as the creator. St. Augustine was fond of saying that God, in granting a physical blessing, always accompanies it with an even greater spiritual blessing. So God feeds his starving people according to his word. I want to see people so consumed of God's word, people who order life so properly that it radically changes the way they see everything. So when they wake in the morning, and they see the sun peeking over the horizon, they think of Jesus, who is the light of the world, which no darkness can overcome. The bright morning star, and the splendor of his Father, I want to see people so consumed of the word that they cannot help but drive past the hospital. And think of Jesus, who is a physician for both body and soul. I want to see people so consumed with the word that they can't possibly drive past a field full of corn or wheat or beans or anything else. And not immediately think so is God's word, which goes out from his mouth. It will not return to him empty, but will accomplish what he desires and achieve the purpose for which he sent it. So that it, like that seed, might yield seed for the sower and bread for the eater. I want people so consumed with the word. When they look at their Christmas trees, they can't help but think of the branch from the stump of Jesse. Great planting of cedar on the Mount of Lebanon. Come to save all the people of this world. Won't you see? God feeds his starving people. He fills the body in order that he might fill the soul to overflowing. I am starving. I am starving to see. I know you're starving too. Because created in God's image, we were made for the spectacular. You have it. In Jesus, the bread of life, come down from heaven to feed our starving souls. May it always be, God grant it, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, 
Pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us from all temptation. And bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you in favor and give you peace.